Okay. I'm just going to close it. Okay, this can go. Yeah. This can go. Yeah, perfect. So this can also go. So now I'll say share screen. Right. Share screen. Story. We'll give share. a couple of more minutes. Sure. Are you seeing my oh. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to hide things. I'm going to hide things before people start judging me. <laughs> oh my God. Cleaning things up. So let me open this. Is this the one? This is not the one. So the, oh no, this is the one. Perfect. Yeah. Are you able to see this? I'm now going to go into full screen mode. Yes, yeah, I can see it. Did that, did that happen? Is the, the cover, right? I went into full screen mode. Can you see it in, PP, in the presentation mode? Are you seeing it in the Yes, mode? yes. Okay, I'm, you, I'm changing it, slides. Can you see it? Uh, yeah, this is what I was going to tell you. Yeah, they are passing. Perfect. Perfectly. So we are good. I'm just going to put this closer so you can hear me better. Okay. okay. I'll give two more minutes to the audience to... Yes, yes. And then I'll give a presentation. Maybe I should turn this light on. There'll be more light on my face. Okay, that's better. Do you know if the field campaign is, is taking place this year as well? I, I haven't heard. I haven't heard anything, so I don't know. Okay, me neither. I'm wondering if they're going to be very busy with the setting up of the course. You heard about this? They're doing- Yes, the yes, yes. I, I heard from Siddharth. Yeah, so they're doing the- first Yeah, probably course. they are busy with that because last year we already knew for that, uh, for these dates, yeah. we already knew about many things on the yeah. campaign. I can't believe it's already going to be one year. Goodness, time just- yeah. yeah, time flies. I haven't even gotten to the samples yet. So I started finally, but uh, you know it takes some time to to really get some results to work with. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's easy to if you don't do it as 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 soon as you arrive, which is really difficult. Then it can it can take for it takes a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go. Yeah. Okay. So I think we can. Well, it's only two minutes. You know about. Spanish punctuality. <laughs> so let's wait. It can, two it, can be, it can be very different from the Indian. We call it yeah. Indian stretchable time. <laughs> it's not Indian, yeah, you know. time. It's Indian stretchable time. Yeah. For us, five minutes is like nothing. It's a, we really need to. Okay, I think we should start. Basically, we have a, a reasonable number of participants, and and as I said, I don't know if there there is going to be there are going to be more people due to the long weekend today. Sure. So let's let's start. Okay, today we have the the pleasure to have with us to tell us about the origins of life and its early evolution, uh, Sudar Rahmani. Sudara Hamani did her postdoc at the FAS Center for Systems Biology at Harvard University, and also at David Dimmer's laboratory at the, the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her interests uh, in research are on astrobiology and especially in the origins of life. She is currently an associate professor at the Indian Institute of Science and Education and Research in Pune. She is principal investigator of chemical origins of life, of life lab, uh, the cool lab, where she and her team, along with other collaborators, use tools from biology, chemistry, geochemistry, and physics, uh, with the aim of delineating the processes and niches that would have allowed for the transition from non-life to life on the early earth. She is also very involved in astrobiology education both formally and via several science outreach programs. In particular, she feels strongly about mentoring schools and university students in their pursuit of astrobiology as a career. 
I had the honor to share time and field work with Suda last summer when we both participated in the field expedition organized by the AMT University of Mumbai, India, and the National Space Society of Australia to the Indian Himalayas to collect samples and study high altitude settings analogous to Mars within the Earth and Space, Space Exploration Program of the AMT University. And today I'm delighted to see her again, albeit by Zoom, and have the chance to listen to the very interesting things that she's gonna tell us about the origins of life and its uh, early evolution. So very welcome, Suda, and everything is yours. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, so much, Laura. Thank you for this invite. Thank you, to, thank you to you and Maria for facilitating this. Super excited to be talking to you all. Again, albeit online, which is a shame, hopefully I'll meet all of you in person sometime soon. Um, so as Laura mentioned, I met Laura mainly uh, when we went to this uh, ESCP expedition to Ladakh last year. And I should please point out that I am nothing of a field experimentalist like Laura is. So I learned a lot from her while I was at this expedition. But what we try and do in our lab at um, the Indian Institute of Science Education and Research is to use a whole bunch of tools, some of which we are very familiar with and some of which our collaborators are more familiar with to basically try and understand how might have the first informational and catalytic polymers come about, what might have been the kind of crosstalk that existed between them and the um, uh, membranous component, which we think was made up of simple lipids like fatty acids and their uh, derivatives, and what kind of these crosstalks would have allowed eventually for the emergence for the first cellular form on the early earth, which we call protocells. And um, before so sort of getting into a little more details about that, and going to give you a bit of the context of how we can think about uh, the transition from chemistry to biology on the early earth. Some of this might be very familiar to some of the audience that's here today. So sorry if, I'm, uh, if it's going to sound uh, like a bit of a repeat, but I just feel like for um, the sake of having uh, taking everybody along, it might be nice to just give that context. So I'll be talking a little more about the uh, origins aspect and touch upon a little about the early evolution aspect when I'm talking about some of the work that we do in our lab in this uh, sort of very broad realm. Uh, sorry about that, there we go. Yeah, so wouldn't be possible without an army of uh, students who helped me out. Uh, I I've been lucky to have a whole bunch of really good grad students, post one very nice organic chemistry postdoc and a whole bunch of undergrads who have gone through my lab. Some of them uh, have already left, but the others are still with me. And uh, yeah, we basically uh, are trying to understand um, how did chemistry evolve from, how did biology come about from chemistry? Should I probably try and see if I can do the pointer? Maybe you can see things a little better. Yeah, is that better? Yeah. So the reason we can think about the transition from non-life to life as a transition from chemistry to biology is because of this beautiful continuum that exists between uh, uh, molecules at various complexities, right? Here is the biological realm. I've used a few examples of amino acids and slightly more higher order structures that they result in, which are, which are enzymes and uh, in this case, both proteinaceous and an RNA enzyme. But zoom into them and what you see is less complex molecules. One can always argue it is not as less complex in the chemical realm because here you're seeing buckyballs which have been shown uh, to be present in the interstellar medium. And these things are as large as made up of uh, C40 atoms, so they're not as less complex as we want to imagine, but surely much less complex than what we see in the biological realm. And zoom into them further and you see that we get into the physical realm where you, you kind of um, are thinking now about how these various atoms come together to make up the simpler molecules in the chemical space, which then are thought to have come about to form ensembles and larger aggregates, which essentially allowed them to have emergent properties which you cannot attribute back to the monomers in the space. But now that essentially is thought to have led, led to the transition from non-life to life on the early earth. So what are the kinds of settings I'm talking about where we think these uh, complex reactions might have been possible going from the non-life to the life space? Depending upon whom you talk to, uh, they, there are two main hypotheses about how simpler biomolecules might have come about on the early earth, predominantly the monomers. One involves exogenous delivery of these molecules, including amino acids and uh, hydroxy acids and a whole suite of other uh, uh, fatty acid-like molecules via meteorites and comets that are thought to have bombard bombarded the earlier just the, like they do today, but at a much higher frequency way, 
back during the early evolution of life. Uh, another group of um, uh, my colleagues focus a lot on what is called terrestrial synthesis, where the idea is to explore the possibility of these uphill reactions happening in niches where there is a lot of interesting chemical and thermal gradients that can be facilitated. And suffice to say, both these modes of um, uh, replenish uh, or plenishing the uh, terra firma with biomolecules would possibly have been very important in my opinion. And that would have sort of set the stage for the initial prebiotic chemistry that is thought to have happened, which led to uh, monomeric molecules that are very relevant to what we see in biochemistry today. And uh, suddenly jumping from there to what actually binds us all together, irrespective of whether you're talking about a bacteria, a human being like Nelson Mandela, T-Rex, mushrooms, giant sequoias, it's fundamentally, it all kind of boils down to one important entity that binds all of life together, and those are cells. So one way of thinking about this transition systematically is to understand how the various components of the earliest cells came about, what kind of niches supported for the formation of the independent components, where might have the crosstalks happen, finally leading to the most um, simplest form of a simplest unit of all life, which is cells. It is not as simple as I'm saying it, right? A lot of biologists who are in this audience will appreciate that. Even the most fundamental unit of all life is mind-blowingly complex. And I'm showing you two cells here, the prokaryotic cell and the eukaryotic cell. We are eukaryotes. Prokaryotic cells are more like bacteria. And even these are like super, super complex. So to think about how this kind of a bacterium would have emerged from the prebiotic soup is a completely non-trivial sort of proposition. So we, and again, again, this is a crowd where Laura is the expert here. You know that despite being so small and microscopic and being single-celled in nature, they have pretty much sort of taken over every niche on terra firma that you can think of, every extreme environment that you can think of where you and I could not survive. So one important way to get to uh, understanding how the earliest of cells came about is you, using a two-pronged approach. Somebody like me, along with my group, we try and use a bottom-up approach to understand how the protocells came about. And uh, Laura and other colleagues in the field who are working on extremophiles use a top-down approach to understand how these molecules basically survive in these conditions, setting the boundaries for essentially where life can exist. So both these sets of information, in my opinion, are extremely important for finally converging on to what we call the ancestral community of cells, which is thought to have essentially been present very early on before the emergence of LUCA, as we call, right? So very uh, an artistic representation here. Uh, basically, it's like a tennis ball, cut open the tennis ball. The outer layer here is a bilayer membrane made up of lipids, just like in your cells and my cells, but much, much more simpler. And it's thought to have encapsulated a replicating genetic material. We are still not sure what it might have been, but RNA is one of the important forerunners in this uh, matter. Uh, and maybe there was a minimal metabolic network that was also present that allowed it to be present, um, uh, be uh, allowed it to exist out of equilibrium so that lifelike processes could have been facilitated. And these protocells could have come together from these uh, common ancestral community of cells, which eventually led to some of the oldest organisms that we now, uh, now know of, cyanobacteria-like organisms, right? So again, again, I'll not talk about this, but the um, emergence of prokaryotes was extremely important for one of the important um, geochemical, uh, geological events that happened on Earth about almost uh, what we think now is close to 3.9 billion years ago, which is, when is they, which is when they came about, but it took a while for them to do what they did, which is the oxygenation of the Earth, which was facilitated because they could uh, undergo a process called photosynthesis. And that then determined the evolution of early life beyond the first uh, bacteria that came about. And I'm not going to be touching uh, about this part at all, but suffice to say, it took another close to a billion and a half years uh, to have eukaryotes emerge, which were much more complex that eventually set the stage for even more complex organisms to emerge. And we came about, literally, if you put all of this on a clock, we literally, we literally emerged about 200,000 uh, 200,000 years ago, which is very close to midnight. So a lot of the saga that uh, happened during the transition from chemistry to biology is 
something that happened around here, close to 3.94 billion years ago. And then the rest of the events happened during the remaining period. And we just came about like, yeah, very, very, very recently. So if you think about the very simplistic view of the tree of life that exists, it's thought that the, this, um, there was this last universal common ancestor, which eventually led to the three domains of life. Uh, this is, like I said, an ultra simplistic image. In the last couple of decades or a decade and a half, uh, more number of uh, uh, experts who work in, phylogen uh, in the field of phylogeny and taxonomy and stuff are increasingly, and in uh, 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 understanding cells, are increasingly of the opinion that it might have been that there was a common ancestral community of primitive cells and a whole bunch of selection pressures which created certain bottlenecks allowed possibly for the formation of, uh, for the emergence of LUCA-like entities which then uh, led to the three domains of life. So this is a very, very simplistic representation of this protocell, but I'm happy to share that in this last century between all that we learned from chemistry, prebiotic chemistry, geology, and some of what the oldest forms of biology reveal to us about their biochemistry, a bit of this puzzle is coming into view and we're getting a better appreciation of how these transitions might have happened. So again, this is, uh, I'm preaching to the choir. So basically I'm trying to say that it's going to, this field of science feeds off from various areas of sciences. And in our lab, we are particularly interested in understanding what is, what, what was the molecular space of the prebiotic, uh, prebiotic soup? The heterogeneous prebiotic soup essentially would have led to the formation and emergence of interesting molecules that are relevant to extant biochemistry. What might they have been? What are the, how did they, how did they talk to each other and lead to the formation of earlier cells? And that led to downstream events, which then led to evol evolution of much more complex life. Um, so this takes me to a very important slide. Even though this is old, I like to keep using it. I know since then there have been variations of this, but this is kind of a crisp and quick view of where do we think all of this drama happened to give you a sense of the timelines. We are looking at what might have happened about 3.8 to 4.2 billion years ago. A lot of this prebiotic chemistry happened closely between uh, clo uh, somewhere between 3.9 to 4.2 billion years ago. And it is thought that at some point very early on during this transition from non-life to life, organisms that came about predominantly used RNA molecules. This is the RNA world hypothesis. This is uh, valid in a sense because RNA molecule is capable of both encoding information and catalyzing reactions. So it reduces the complexity of understanding this problem because now you have to mainly focus on trying to understand how the RNA molecule came about from the heterogeneous prebiotic soup. Um, last couple of decades of research in a few of our labs across the world is increasingly making us appreciate the fact that going from this prebiotic space to RNA world space is completely non-trivial. So it might have been predated by presence of simpler informational molecules, quote unquote, simpler informational molecules, which then eventually transition to what we now understand as an RNA world. Um, sorry about that. I don't know why this does it. And these are the niches where these um, very, very fascinating events might have happened. One of the niches, um, actually both of them for that matter, sorry. Um, again, depending on whom you talk to in the field, there are these heavy duty supporters of um, vent systems, volcanic systems that are present on the ocean floor. These are hydrothermal vent systems. They facilitate a lot of interesting chemical possibilities and thermal fluxes to um, provide niches that can facilitate a lot of these uphill reactions because a lot of transition reactions from chemistry to biology involve formation of polymers from monomers. And these are all condensation reactions which are not necessarily thermodynamically favorable at all. So one needs to either invoke a geological phenomenon that would have facilitated it or geological or geochemical phenomenon or intrinsically think about how molecules could have been activated to begin with to be able to undergo some of these reactions. We in our group are uh, more comfortable working with these niche, uh, this niche, which is essentially a volcanic setting in uh, terrestrial um, uh, environments. This is present close to volcanoes, where again, the, the activity that happens because of the volcanoes and all that uh, aqueous uh, rock phase interactions provides a lot of very cool chemical and thermal gradients that 
facilitate these uphill reactions, which I'll show you in a second, yeah? Um, again, these are just examples. The field started, the field of prebiotic, start, prebiotic chemistry sort of, the foundations can be, um, can, can, goes back to the famous Opera and Haldane theory, who essentially independently proposed that you had inorganic molecules come about, which uh, were present in a vast prebiotic ocean-like setting, and you had a lot of energy sources like lightning, ultraviolet radiations, which facilitated these so-called uphill reactions to allow for the transition from the inorganic space to an organic space, which then set the stage for a lot of interesting prebiotic reactions. So the field of prebiotic chemistry, the fundamental notion of what it could be was sort of set with this theory, but it didn't take foothold till the first demonstration happened via the Miller-Urey experiment, very famous Miller-Urey experiment, right? Here on the left, you see a whole bunch of molecules. Um, again, the assumption back then was that early earth was very reducing in its environment. And when they were present in this prebiotic sort of ocean, you could have had energy sources like uh, lightning uh, in this particular case, already early earth was thought to have been much hotter than, uh, than present and present temperatures. The notion is that 60 to, it's, it would have been anywhere from 60 degrees to 90 to 100 degrees, depending again on whom you talk to, but it was much hotter than now. And in these environments, you could have very readily have interesting reactions come about when you had a very high energy lightning-like phenomenon occur, which then resulted in the formation of a whole bunch of simple monomers, predominantly the monomers that uh, Miller, uh, Stanley Miller demonstrated in the first experiment were either hydroxy acids or simple amino acids. Since then, um, his first grad student, Jeff Bada, and one of his, uh, one, of, one of the la few of his last grad students, Jim Cleaves, got together to retest Miller's original samples. Miller saved them really, really systematically. And they went on to also redo this experiment. And this experiment has been tried to be reproduced with certain variations to the setup by a few different groups in the world. And they've gone on to show that with the more advanced techniques, you can actually see that this seemingly simplistic setup very readily allows for the formation of not just simple amino acids and hydroxy acids, but even more complex amino acids, but they're formed in much smaller amounts, but they nevertheless are readily formed even under these conditions. So given all of this context, there are these models that exist that allow us to think about how do you go from the prebiotic space of monomers to a space where you can now start having the oldest of cellular life come about. And this particular theory is called the terrestrial origins of life theory. This was predominantly pushed uh, forward by Dave Diemer, uh, my mentor, my first mentors in the field. And the idea is, is as follows. Here is sort of a tidal pool. And if in this tidal pool, you had molecules relevant to the kind of uh, simplistic biochemical molecules that we're thinking about. Informational molecule would be RNA, um, uh, small catalytic molecule will be peptides, and then your, your membrane molecules would be essentially lipidic molecules, simple amphiphilic molecules, right? If you had the monomers of these entities present in this tidal pool, geologically relevant wet dry cycles, which are driven by seasonal changes, diurnal changes, can very readily provide a scenario wherein you could have what are called wet dry cycles. Yeah, for example, during the day, temperatures are much hotter. There's a dehydration cycle. And during this dehydration cycle, if you have, for example, two nucleotides, two monomers of RNA present in the vicinity, and if they are in close proximity, you can essentially facilitate pulling out of water from the scenario and the resultant formation of a phosphodiester linkage. So if you had multiple of these cycles happening over several billions of years, one can envisage a scenario where you could have, in this case, it's these red squiggles that you're seeing here. They are now beginning to grow, right? Because every dehydration phase, the lipid monomers, which readily form higher order structures and aqueous conditions because of thermodynamic effect, they now collapse into these multi-lamellar sandwiches and they provide a concentration effect which brings together these monomeric molecules to now come in close proximity and undergo this very interesting uphill reactions. A subsequent rehydration cycle will very readily allow them to once again reform vesicles. And now these cell-like systems have encapsulated genetic material in them, which then can 
one can think of ways in which simplistic selection uh, selection scenarios would have allowed for multiple of these uh, multiple of these cycles would have been driven by the geological cycles and simplistic selection uh, uh, regimes would have allowed for evolution of these cells to slightly more interesting fun cells and i'll talk about that in one of our results uh, uh, when i talk to mention about one of my projects this inset that you see here is actually a real microscopy image of decanoic acid and decanol containing vesicles so decanoic acid is a c10 fatty acid it has ch 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 sort of 10 of them and um, it's been mixed with and it has a carboxylic acid head group and it's mixed in one is to one ratio with its derivative where the carboxylic acid is replaced with an alcohol head group so when you mix them in one is to one ratio they can very readily form these vesicular tubular cellular structures and just like this terrestrial hypothesis proposes when you have rehydration conditions these multilamellar sandwiches which is shown here in this freeze fracture image can readily bleb out into vesicles and here you're seeing this fluorescent color because there has been a fluorescent dye to be able to show you much more ready visualization of how these structures form. So this is sort of the model that exists. And um, uh, I don't know, Ankita wants to say something looks like it, um, but I'm moving on. So in, in the years since 1953, when Stanley and Miller demonstrated the experiment for the first time, uh, we've had enough interesting results come from a few labs in the world that, uh, that particularly from the Sutherland group, wherein we now know how do you go from a bunch of inorganic molecules to precursors that led to proteins, the family of proteins, the nucleoside precursors that led to DNA and RNA, and lipidic pre precursors that resulted in protocellular membranes. So like I said, the uh, way you think about uh, what precise events might have happened in this uh, terrestrial geothermal space where the terrestrial model of cellular emergence might have happened. The way to think about it is prebiotic chemistry led to the formation of fun building blocks. And without enzymes, these building blocks could have formed much longer polymers. The reason it was non-enzymatic or it would have been non-enzymatic is because you have the chicken and egg problem otherwise. You need the information in the nucleic acid encoded to form the protein but then you need the protein to form these really long nucleic acids. So which came first? And this is why the RNA world hypothesis is such an important respite to be able to think about non-enzymatic means of doing things. And again, once you had a reasonable length um, set, a, a reasonable uh, chain length of polymers come about, uh, some of them with very interesting functions, one can think about non-enzymatic replication mechanisms that would have allowed them to perpetuate themselves in the scenario then all the crosstalk that they had with the primordial membranes that were present and possibly some primitive metabolic networks that were present is thought to have eventually led to these protocellular systems. Um, so in our lab, we do a whole bunch of things. We're very interested in emergence of informational molecules, catalytic molecules made of proteins or combinations of um, uh, nucleotides and amino acids thereof and protocells. We're very interested in understanding uh, what are the uh, trans, uh, what are the kinetics and fidelity of non-enzymatic replication processes. So one immediate thought is, if there are no enzymes, everything would have been very shoddy. So how would things even work, right? So work from uh, Irene's group, my group, and certain other groups in Europe uh, have gone on to show that even though information transfer without enzymes is shoddy, there still is a selective advantage. Uh, there would have still been a selective advantage on the early earth where this particular error rate not being that great would have been advantageous in the sense that one could have, one could think about sampling a much larger sequence space in a much shorter time as against when things were all perfect and you could take molecule A and make multiple copies of B, B right? Now with uh, multiple copies of A, that's what happens in our cells today. But Though there is, a, there is a propensity for mutation to occur, we have a huge uh, suite of uh, error correction machinery that fixes things now. But on the early earth, the notion is that it was all completely chemically and geolo geologically driven. So the error um, mechanisms would have been much more prominent, but that has a selective advantage. We are also very interested in understanding how metal mediated catalysis might have, might have happened. Because even if you look at modern enzymes, a lot of the modern enzymes have a metal core 
which is directly involved in catalyzing reactions or is extremely important for the structural integrity of the protein. This sort of gives you a hint that maybe very early on in life, you had much more simpler scaffolds and um, uh, uh, which basically still coordinated with metals and facilitated reactions, maybe not as um, efficiently, but they nevertheless could facilitate catalysis. And all of the work that we're doing in our lab has fundamental implications for um, habitability and related aspects, uh, which um, is something that's a hot topic in the field now. So I finished 30 minutes. Uh, Laura, do you want me to go into one or two of the projects a little more in detail? Yeah, so sure, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so let me see. Okay, so I'll give you a flavor of uh, one, uh, one project in the realm of RNA world hypothesis and another one in the realm of the amphiphilic landscape business. This is the first student who joined me about 11 years ago now. And he was very interested in understanding the terrestrial model for origin of life. He wanted to know in that context, in that paradigm, how would you go from monomers of, or, uh, monomers of RNA to polymers of RNA? Was he the first one to demonstrate this? No, because in my postdoc with Dave, we started doing these experiments. But what we learned very quickly is that even though RNA-like polymers were forming, Chaitanya was beginning to show that these RNA-like polymers were not intact informational molecules. What do I mean by that? So one of the important things the, uh, that uh, both Chaitanya and me kept in mind while we were doing these experiments is to not work with very active, inherently active molecules. Inherently active molecules are super important to help us appreciate how some of these processes happen and it's uh, important to work with them. But increasingly there is clear um, a sort of understanding that even to think about how they came about in large enough concentrations is completely non-trivial, completely by chemical means. So the idea is to work with simpler molecules like in this case, it's five prime nucleoside monophosphate which is a non-active monomer. And if you start working with them, what you see is you form these oligomers, but these blue colored entities, which is the informational moiety, like adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine, is missing from several of the positions. So then he got an idea. He was like, hey, Sudha, why do we care about the informational molecule? Let's not do that. Let's just see if we can form sugar phosphate backbones. And once we form these sugar phosphate backbones, we can condense any kind of informational moiety onto this backbone to form a lot of different kinds of information polymers. Our inspiration was sort of work that was happening in the Nick Hud group uh, with able support from Ram Krishnamurti. And we were wondering if we can actually start synthesizing uh, non-enzymatically in uh, realistic prebiotic conditions, if we can actually show the demonstration of this pre-RNA world polymers. And he went on to actually show the formation of the monomer uh, of a pre-RNA world uh, molecule. In this case, this is not AU, G, and C like you see in the RNA, this is a molecule called, called barbituric acid. So these, are, excuse me, these are all alternate bases. And even these bases are very interesting because they can, they have the capability of information transfer, which is why they can be considered for, for making, synthesizing an information molecule. So he went on to show that you can not only form this poly monomer, but you can also crassly polymerize them to result in oligomers. However, that particular reaction is a very, very complex reaction. So we went, and now in more recent work, we're very systematically trying to demonstrate what is called polymer fusion hypothesis. You have a polymeric sugar phosphate backbone onto which you're condensing, you're condensing um, informational moieties to form informational polymers. That is one of the important ways we think that early, early informational molecules might have come about. And this is essentially that hypothetical lineage for nucleic acids that has been proposed by Nick Hutt, where the notion is that prior to DNA and RNA, you had a space where the molecules had certain elements of what is present in DNA or RNA now, but the other entities would have been altogether something else. And we, uh, I'm very happy to share that we have been one of the people uh, who, who are sort of forerunners in this field and we are showing a lot of uh, fun primitive genetic polymers that can readily form. In the other, uh, I think, uh, sorry, give me a second. In the other uh, project, I'd like to talk about what we are doing in the realm of membranes, yeah? Membranes are very, very primitive. Membranes are very, very interesting. Just uh, when you form vesicular structures with fatty acid membranes and fatty acid, uh, kick, um, uh, cousins of fatty acids, like fatty alcohols, glycerol monoesters of fatty acids, even these primitive membranes very readily form these vesicular structures like I showed you before. And here are 
two snapshots. This is from Dave's group. On the left hand is monocarboxylic acids, which were extracted from the core of the Murchison meteorite. They were ranging in the, uh, in the size of C8 to C11 uh, carbons, had other interesting um, sort of um, um, uh, ringed structures present too. These are called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and they could readily form these very beautiful vesicular structures when they were, uh, they were put in aqueous conditions. On the right side, much more controlled experiment. You're basically seeing vesicles and tubular, circular vesicles and tubular vesicle structures that are formed by combinations of decanoic acid and decanol. So they can form these compartments readily. Not just that, a very interesting bunch of work from Jack Shostak and his group, including Irene, has gone on to show that without invoking any genetic mechanism at all, you can demonstrate, sorry about that, you can demonstrate growth and division in these simplistic vesicular structures. And catalysis has been demonstrated in this uh, vesicular system. In this case, Irene went on to show that if you have what is called a RNA ribozyme, a, a hammerhead ribozyme was encapsulated into the vesicle and the magnesium ion, which is extremely crucial for it to undergo self cleavage was introduced on the outside. It crosses this very, very simple fatty acid membrane and then demonstrated catalysis happening readily. So not just that, uh, Irene has gone on to also um, sort of show a primitive version of competition among cells, two kinds of population she had. In one, she encapsulated them with uh, the cells, uh, the vesicular systems had an encapsulated genetic material. The other ones had empty vesicles. And what she went on to show is that the vesicles which had already an encapsulated genetic material grew at the expense of the empty uh, cells and nothing, no genetic machinery involved here, simple physical chemical properties of these membranes drove this competition, allowing for the selective growth of one kind of population versus the other. So given all of the cool stuff that these things do, fatty acid based vesicles do, what we have been wanting to understand is how can we think about the evolutionary processes once the most simple protocells came about and there are multiple ways to think about the selection pressures that might have shaped this landscape of membrane molecules. You can think about, again, complete physical properties of the environment, physical chemical properties of the environment, right? The pH would have been very important because the fatty acid membranes, unlike the phospholipid molecules that are components of our membranes, are very, very sensitive to the pH. They only form vesicles when the pH is equivalent to the pKa of the head group. You veer away from that pH, they fall apart. So then the question is, okay, you have all this growth and division happening, competition happening, but they are so sensitive to everything. They're sensitive to pH, they're sensitive to divalent cations, they are sensitive to a whole bunch of other things, temperature. How then do we think about this landscape and actually uh, start characterizing robust vesicular systems, which are still prebiotically relevant? This is something that initially was started by Sushovan here and uh, was ably assisted by Shika, and we have done a lot of very interesting work in this area where we are beginning to talk about what kinds of early selection pressures might, might have shaped this landscape and what kind of mo molecules might have had an advantage in this scenario. And now we are also um, uh, trying to understand um, systematically how compositional complexity, again, I'm being very, very careful with the term, increase of compositional heterogeneity, did that in itself provide a selective advantage to processes like growth, replication, so on and so forth. So I'll stop with this and I'm happy to take questions and I'm happy to delve more into details about some of this work if anybody wants to talk about it. Thank you. For your Thank attention. you very much, Suda. I'll, I'll leave you with this slide. You can ruminate on this slide while Laura is saying. <laughs> okay, as an inspiration. It was a very interesting talk. Thank you very much for it. Um, we are quite some people, so I'm sure there may be some questions that you may directly ask to Suda using your microphone, or if you cannot, or you are more comfortable, you can just let it write in on the, on the parallel chat, and I will just pick it up for her. I'll just, I'll just kind of come out of this then, so it's easier for me to see the chat. And in the meanwhile, uh, Suda, I, I would like to ask you a few, a couple of questions, actually. Sure, sure, sure. sure. I, I was curious, this may be a, a silly question, but I, I was just curious about the, some of the slides you have shown that uh, you showed some, I don't know if we can call them vesicles in general, both of them, but some of them were like round shaped, 
whereas other were more tubular. What, what's the difference or why are they formed in one way or the other? Does it depend on physical chemical conditions or how, how does it work? So what we have seen is this is a very complex problem and we still don't understand it in all honesty. What happens when you take amphiphiles, any kind of amphiphiles, uh, these are molecules which have a water-loving head group, water-hating tail, just like the phospholipid uh, molecules in our membranes. Only thing is this is one head group and a single chain. The second you take a critical concentration of them and put them in um, aqueous conditions, one of the first things they tend to do readily is to form multivesicular vesicles. I didn't show any of that image, but what you'll see is a big vesicle with many, many other vesicles in, entrapped inside. That is mm -hmm. what they most readily form. What, um, when, what we have noticed is when you play around with the uh, ionic concentrations in the vicinity, like you change the concentration of, for example, the sodium or the magnesium or the ammonium or any of the cations for that matter, uh, anions for that matter, and the pH, suddenly they start doing these other kinds of things. And not just this, I talked to you about that uh, primitive uh, version of competition between protocells. In reality, when we actually are doing, now, doing this work in the lab now with uh, very, very systematically using certain systems where we are playing around with the complexity of the membranes composition, what we're seeing is, it's prey predator like experiments. What we're seeing is when we have molecules where, uh, where we have uh, systems where one system has a composition which has a selective advantage to grow faster than the other system. This other system starts shrinking and these starts growing out tubularly. Okay. When the growth happens, it's happen happening to be more tubular and it doesn't necessarily grow only as a spherical system. What determines this is not clear to us. There's okay. a lot of things involved in this and I really am not really sure how this works. But we have noticed what we can fundamentally attribute some of this is this too is uh, the pH, the temperature, the ionic composition, all of this seems to have some role to play in this. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have a question by Pablo that I think he can just connect his microphone. Hi. Thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. I have a lot of questions. I have to choose um, which one to ask. But there was this uh, paper that I read recently. You've been you've mentioned in your talk how membranes are are actually quite uh, fragile, right? If you have like high millimolar concentrations, they can destabilize. If you have um, a lot of um, cations in the in the medium, it can they can destabilize. Yeah. And I saw a paper recently that reported how very simple prebiotic amino acids in the yeah. in the liquid medium can stabilize these membranes by binding the canoic acid. And I was wondering if you have tried this and if you have uh, tested this or... Yes, yes. It's so, really okay. interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So unfortunately, uh, like I said, I haven't had the chance to talk about a lot of things, but I'm just wondering if I can quickly show you one thing. Just give me one second. I'll just sure. put the slide in the background and then talk about it. Uh, where did I go? Share again. Go back to, I don't know what you're seeing, but please bear with me. Uh, sure. The, the, the fountain had made me at this now. Mm, no, INST, INST talk, yeah. So if I just show you the, the kind of stuff you're talking about, right? Let me go with this slide. Can you see the slide? Yep. Yeah, so you're now looking at systems here, which are C11 systems. One hydrocarbon chain length more than the deconoic acid system. Mm -hmm. The only big difference is your deconoic acid is a fully saturated system, whereas your UDA has one unsaturation at the very end. So what we wanted to do is nobody in the field has systematically looked at every chain length very closely. Predominant work has happened with deconoic acid and it has happened with oleic acid. Uh, some very interesting piece of work has come from Midas oleic acid, but otherwise if you go with very small chain lengths or if you go with too much unsaturation are you, or too much saturation, you have other issues. But what we wanted to try and understand is a whole bunch of things, particularly in the context of subjecting these systems to multiple selection pressures to see what survives. In this mm -hmm. particular slide, what you're seeing is what you're referring to, magnesium, yeah? Very, very important for RNA structure formation, RNA catalysis, 
but very, very, very problematic the second you start um, thinking about vesicle formation. What mm -hmm. the slide here is showing is, I will just use two panels. The very first panel is just the fatty acid alone, C11 fatty acid system. You see how readily it starts destabilizing even in the presence of four millimolar magnesium. Yeah. You start now destabilizing and forming crystals, right? But if I even complexify the system, quote unquote complex, complexify the system by increasing the number of compositions from one to two, fatty acid, and here fatty acid plus glycerol containing head group of the fatty acid, you suddenly now make the system much more stable to higher concentrations of magnesium. And what we went on to systematically show in this paper is that more the complexity, more is the stability. And here, if you go to a tertiary system, which had, sorry about that, uridylic acid, uh, pop, 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 where did I go? Yeah, which has uridylic acid, the glycerol head group containing version of the fatty acid and the alcohol head group containing fatty acid. Suddenly, in most of the magnesium concentrations, you're forming very stable vesicles. And how do we know that this is not being driven by something else and it's actually being uh, catalyzed by the presence of magnesium? This is where I answer your question. We actually used two things. One is we used EDTA, which is a known chelator of magnesium, to see mm -hmm. if we can reverse the process. And what we showed is we can very readily reverse the process. But then the argument is EDTA is not very prebiotically relevant. So that's so can we think of other prebiotically relevant chelators? And this is where your question directly fits in. People have shown simple amino acids that can do this or simplistic short dimopeptides that can do this. One of the more sort of screening kind of work in this regard came from Jack's lab. Jack shows tax lab, um, but we have been more focused on systematically trying to use um, amino acids or escalators, and I'm happy to share that it works. What actually happens is you need to play around with the concentration of the monomeric amino acid, the dimer, the trimer, the tetramer, the pentamer, and figure out in what threshold can you reverse the process. So that is throwing up some interesting results, but it's also throwing up more questions. That's that's amazing. Yeah, you fully answered the question. Thank you so much. Oh, you're most welcome. <laughs> I see something else in chat. Yes, I can speak it up for everyone, just in case. We have a question from Marina Fernandez. She asks, how visible is the synthesis of lipids by a very simple non-enzymatic non protometabolism? So it turns out, Marina, there is... A a process called Fischer-Tropff synthesis, Fischer-Tropff type synthesis. It's called FTT synthesis. I'm happy to share some of these resources with um, Laura and she can forward it to you. In these FTT type synthesis reactions, all you need is carbon monoxide, water, but you need to invoke extremely high temperatures and pressures like what you might see on the bottom of the ocean. And when you do that, you can actually go from carbon monoxide plus water to a realm where you can start forming hydrocarbon chains of multiple lengths. And you can think of simplistic processes where the uh, head group got sort of um, uh, embellished to form the carboxylic acids. So do we know of some of these non-enzymatic chemical ways in which simple lipids can form? The answer is yes. But sort of to step back and give you a more uh, cohesive answer about how the field thinks about where these fatty acids and their derivatives might have come about. One is the fischer tropff type synthesis, which can happen on Earth in the sort of uh, volcanic systems of the ocean. The other way to also think about this is that exogenous delivery that I talked to you about. So it turns out um, these kinds of um, simplistic fatty acids can very readily form in uh, interstellar medium driven chemical reactions. So they can then get entrapped into the uh, sort of um, cores of ices and they can get delivered via meteorites and stuff. But I am more comfortable with the uh, terrestrial synthesis of um, carbon monoxide and hydro water containing system, uh, carbon monoxide plus H2O and at, the, at very high temperatures and pressures. Yes, you can non-enzymatically very readily form fatty acids. The more complex derivatives, it's non-trivial. Fatty acids, possible. I hope that helped. Yeah, thank you, Suda. Antonio has a question. Another question from Antonio. He says, uh, thank you for the inspiring talk. I have two short questions. In your opinion, which metals 
would be the igneous agents in the catalytic process that you showed? And yeah, maybe you, you want to ask first. So this is a project that we recently embarked upon where we are much more systematically trying to understand why certain metals are overrepresented in biology than others. And this is very important because it allows us to walk our way back to try and test whether these metals that we see in biology today, are they even prebiotically relevant when you take out all the enzymes and all the interesting complexity that comes from facilitating reactions in a cellular milieu? And the answer is, it is a non-trivial answer, Antonio, it's very complex, but some of the divalent cations which we are seeing uh, being used extensively in um, extant biology, like magnesium, like uh, some enzymes use cobalt, some enzymes use zinc. We are actually seeing that when we kind of work with minimal scaffolded enzymes, they still seem to be doing catalysis of certain redox-like reactions much more readily than uh, other, other uh, divalent cations. But then some of those divalent, cat divalent cations, which are not successful in our reactions, are still being represented in biology. So I think it's a complex mix of a whole bunch of parameters, which includes very importantly, selection pressures over billions of years, which kept changing. So you have to think about the availability, availability of the metals. You have to think about the selection pressures that allow for certain things to remain available in soluble, usable sort of a uh, variation as against being lost in an inorganic space where they're completely kind of uh, bound with some other atom and they are like a hard rock or a mineral and not doing anything fun. Um, but yeah, so magnesium is actually super, super important in the catalysis that I was talking about, which was shown in the vesicle. So you have these um, RNA enzymes, and this is not true only for RNA enzymes. A lot of proteinaceous enzymes also need magnesium for their function, but a good bit of the RNA enzymes that have been worked on by different groups, Dave Bartel's group, Peter Unrao, Irene, um, and Jack Shostak uh, too, has, they've all showed that magnesium in a certain concentration is super crucial for the function of the ribozyme. So I hope that has answered your question. But there's, there's sort of the suite of both monovalent and divalent cations, like sodium is very, very important. Sodium uh, concentration on the early earth is a bit debated, but it's thought to be in a couple of hundreds of millimolar range. Uh, that is so very, very important for formation of robust vesicles too. If you do not have a positively charged ions in the milieu and you're working with fatty acid vesicles, you will never be able to form good vesicles at all because the head groups are all negatively charged and they ripple each other. So the homogeneous vesicular systems always require divalent cations in reasonable amount to be able to form robust vesicular systems. So again. Okay, thank you, Suda. And uh, the last question I think is, uh, and the second one would be, uh, have you tried any of them and also varying concentrations and the reaction conditions in the presence of the metal complex? We are trying as we speak. So as I speak, one of my fifth year master thesis student um, has been trying to look at this problem in a little more systematic manner. We just put out recently a couple of months ago, a review in ACS Omega, where we have certain ideas about how we can think about emergence of particularly uh, protoporphyrins. If you look at a lot of modern enzymes, the scaffold that they use is porphyrin, including in chlorophyll molecule. So certain scaffolds seem to have been selected for, and they are very uh, repeatedly represented in many of the modern enzymes. So we then wondered what, what might be a putative evolutionary pathway for protoporphyrins. And if we can use the information that we have of, proto, of, proto, of porphyrin, sorry, porphyrin-based enzymes from today and work, work our way back, can we actually sort of synthesize some of these protoporphyrins to systematically understand their catalytic efficiencies, turnover, so on and so forth. So yeah, hold your breath and hopefully we'll have some data coming out in the next half year or something. But yes, it's very interesting that com the concentration matters, the pH matters because the methylation uh, process where the metal is coordinating with the scaffold, that's also non-trivial. Now, if you look at chlorophyll, for example, magnesium is the main divalent cation that you see in modern chlorophyll pigment, but that is not very readily methylating under many of the conditions that we tried. So that begs the question, why is magnesium so represented in biology while under more prebiotic conditions, it's very difficult to methylate it readily. 
So we don't have mm -hmm. straightforward answers, but hopefully we'll be able to answer some of them. Great. Thank you so much, Sudan. Oh, my pleasure. For being with us today and tell us so many interesting things. Thanks, thanks. I, I hope again, this didn't feel a little like all of it. I mean, I just wanted to yeah. give the context and then touch upon maybe a couple of projects that we work on, no? Yeah, we got a very nice, great uh, general picture of it. So thank you, thank thank you, you for everybody. joining us and uh, we'll be in contact, okay? With these, with our samples from- uh... Absolutely, I'm at a place where I can start talking more about it, we should. The other focuses have now gotten taken care of. So yes, this is now the important focus. So more soon, I'll be in touch with you. Okay, great. Thank you again and uh, well, have a nice evening. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye. And the rest of you, see you on the next seminar. And on Thursday, have a nice long weekend, all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye, <laughs> same to you.